Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 22nd session of what has been uh, a discussion, an ongoing discussion around the question of what is a library if the building is closed. Uh, this will be our 10th session. Uh, the previous nine have been recorded and posted on uh, the website there on this, you can see on the screen, giglibraries.net, the pandemic response page. You'll see them all. They're not indexed yet, not broken into various speakers and points to locate those, but we're working on that. They'll be up soon, we hope, we should, they, well, they will. And um, so last week we, we took a Friday off. Uh, it felt pretty good after nine in a row, uh, just kind of out of the gate. And uh, so this feels like then a, a not exactly a, a turning point in this whole episode, crisis, pandemic, but there's a shift happening. Uh, you know, this general opening, certainly an urge for it, uh, is, is rising very rapidly and we're starting to see actual uh, loosening of the uh, shelter in place restrictions, uh, different kinds of enterprises, public and private, are finding ways to uh, open their doors, offer their services. I have seen some of these sessions. One way before. or another. Uh, uh, our, our session, our, all of our sessions, and today included are being hosted by uh, the International Federation of Library Associations based in Brussels. And uh, at the control room there is uh, Stephen Weiber of IFLA. Uh, Stephen, say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Come from Europe. <laughs> Stephen, Thanks, and I've been, Stephen and I have been working on uh, public access policies for several years now. IFLA is an extraordinary organization, and it's part of our overall strategy to uh, uh, work with libraries everywhere uh, to, well, in response, so to segue to the what we're calling round two. This is kicking off a, a, a second phase series, uh, and we're we're shifting from a moment when when libraries and everybody else were simply in uh, in in defense mode, uh, just trying to hold on and figure out what was going on. Uh, the the web services, of course, were still up. Not only were they up, the Demand has been skyrocketing for digital services from libraries. Uh, and so over the last couple of months, uh, this has evolved. And so a lot of changes have happened. New services are being offered, like Zoom, for example. A lot of libraries now have licensed Zoom copies for their uh, patrons to use and, uh, and, and so on. So a lot of interesting things have happened. Too much to keep up with. Uh, uh, but now we're, you know, kind of looking at, at how libraries can, can be more active and assertive in, in response to the, uh, to the circumstance. What new things can libraries uh, think about and offer as they, as they shift their model? Because pretty much everybody agrees we're not going back to a prior normal. Uh, you know, there may be a number of things will recover, undoubtedly, but we'll also be, it'll be happening in a new way. Uh, we'll try to open gradually, hopefully gradually, carefully, safely, uh, but there may be times we'll have to retreat and, and reclose the buildings and, and kind of go back to an earlier stage of, of uh, activity and services. So we're calling this new round Libraries in Response. It also happens to be the title of a proposal that we've just made to the Internet Society. Uh, which, of course, we haven't heard yet, but it's the title that we used to talk about what libraries are doing, especially in regard to uh, access. Uh, the, the categories that we put under uh, what is a library were basically aspects related to internet access, digital services, physical materials, and then uh, as a result of a presentation from uh, a librarian in Denmark, who reminded us of the important social role uh, of libraries in their communities for cohesion, 
uh, we added this fourth element of, of uh, uh, social infrastructure. So uh, we're not the authorities on any or even all of, much less all of these, but we have spent a lot of time on the access part, connectivity, infrastructure, and the role of libraries in building out uh, community connectivity infrastructure, which of course is critical in general, and the lack of it in the US, I can certainly say, has been an embarrassment, uh, but is now just completely unacceptable. Uh, and most notably uh, in the uh, context of, of what is school. School is now basically only online. The, the challenge of how to open school in the fall is just monumental. In the best of times, school is a logistical nightmare, but now it's just really hard to imagine uh, what, what they're up to. Uh, so many students lack access at home, and if you're not online, you're not at school. Uh, it's just a basic, uh, obvious situation. So that's why uh, setting up more uh, access points is just sort of the obvious strategy to at least do something. You know, and, and we've used this uh, image from, from uh, Washington, the drive-in Wi-Fi hotspot as uh, sort of the key for that, for that concept. And then I've posted a, a story in the chat uh, that talks about a city uh, on the border of Texas and Mexico, Laredo, which has done this kind of a thing. The city and the school district, which are typically different you know, public entities, uh, are partnering to set these up around town to give at least this minimum, basic, absolute minimum definition of, a, of universal access, someplace within ideally walking distance or at least driving distance of everybody. We think that's a global principle and are, and are uh, actively working on that. Uh, so IFLA's hosting us today. Uh, Broadband Breakfast is a, a media co-host been, been promoting this and we encourage everybody else to do so as well. Uh, I just touched on that, you know, the, the question about what is a library. Uh, assuring access to public information is an essential service. We say it over and over again, but it's absolutely uh, true, and uh, we highly recommend that libraries make that point, uh, especially in, with regard to government, uh, public, uh, public data, public forms and the rest of it, the things that libraries already do and do best. Uh, this is who we are, an open collaboration of libraries trying to do interesting uh, things with technology. And uh, so in effect, access is around library Wi-Fi, where it is and how to provide it, uh, because it's the universal interface now for libraries, since there's no inside building connection, it's all wireless. Of course, you can use your cell phone to get to the library digital service. directly to the library requires Wi-Fi today. So this is lead that, at least in our opinion. So here we are, and uh, here are our excellent speakers today. We have Cindy Aiden returning from uh, Washington, the State Library, and there Cindy was with us in early April presenting uh, what they were doing up there, and things have been happening since. Uh, we'll then go to Mark uh, Colwell, who will talk to us about uh, I just use the acronym here. It's the Educational Broadcast Services Spectrum, uh, which was, well, Mark will tell us about. It. It's a really important uh, spectrum for connectivity. And then John Sallet uh, with the Benton Institute will uh, give us a, a, a kind of a big picture uh, and a point we need to take. So with that, I will stop share, stop talking, and uh, introduce uh, Cindy. I did introduce Cindy already. So Cindy, you are up and thank you.
Cindy. You're on mute, Cindy. Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> you know what? It doesn't say I am. Am I still on mute? No, we hear you fine. Oh, good. That's so weird. Sorry about that. I'm, no I'm leaning in because I want to be sure you can hear me clearly. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I see a lot of my colleagues on the phone call this morning. I appreciate it. Um, it's early in my world. My hair is still wet, so I'm happy to see people got out of bed. <laughs> I am the state librarian here in Washington State, and I have been so fortunate to have a fabulous collaboration with many people across the state, and it has resulted in better connectivity for our citizens in, a, in an emergency response way, in that we are creating public Wi-Fi spots all over the state. And it also has um, brought me in contact with a lot of great people who are committed to trying to make this work. So uh, when I talked to you a couple of weeks ago, I told you, I believe, that I was working with the Office of Broadband here in the state of Washington. That's a new office, and our broadband director has only been with us since last October. But this was a great opportunity for us to try and do something fast. Washington State University has an extension office. It's a grant, uh, what is that called, a land-grant institution. And it has offices all over the counties of Washington State. And there is a wonderful person with a very deep history of rural uh, digital activities in the state, Monica Babine. And she and I and the director of broadband started talking about what we could do. And we got wonderful funding. Microsoft gave us initial funding for the first phase. Aviso stepped in. We started to get all kinds of other people involved. Uh, WaTech at the at the government level, of course. Um, I report into the Secretary of State's office, so I had the support of the Secretary of State's office behind me. The Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, which is the uh, state organization that oversees education. NDTRC. I see that Todd is on the phone. Um, we got um, Noanet stepped in and we got all kinds of people involved and the best part about the project is that already in washington state i had a lot of public libraries who had figured out they had to turn their routers to face the parking lot this project gave them the opportunity to get an outside mounted router and have a much broader and stronger signal and to get on a map and say that they were really available. Well, between the outside routers we were able to get for some libraries and the fact that some libraries were already prepared, we were able to post on the Office of Broadband's map over 300 library sites, about 340 sites that are just libraries that are offering this public Wi-Fi. In addition, as a result of this effort, to get more public Wi-Fi hotspots available. Other schools have come on board, other community centers, and we have a, a SWAT team going around the state right now, putting uh, some more outside sites up. So the sum total, which I think is the biggest win of all, is that we have a unified picture of serving the public that includes libraries working with all these other partners and having one story about how we're trying to serve our public. And that to me was the biggest part of the story. It was fun to see the broadcast of this project, which was I think about a week ago, because the various people, stakeholders who wanted to um, talk about it, drove to the four corners of the state and stood in Wi-Fi parking uh, lots all over the state and, and said how it was working. It was a really fun broadcast. I think it still shows up on the Department of Commerce's Facebook page. So the partnership piece, uh, Don said, you know, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is partnerships and working together. And also, it's great to remind everybody that libraries are in the business of serving their public and that they are public gathering points. People want to know their library is still serving them. So they're a natural partner 
in these kinds of big projects. And I'm just so proud of all of my library directors for, for stepping it up and being part of this. I'm watching Great. Don, it looks like he's leaning in. Yes. Yeah, sorry, uh, <laughs> also muted. Uh, that's great. So uh, are you tracking uh, usage? You know, how many people have used these uh, new APs? Well, you know, the one, st the one stat I have, well, there are two things that are really uh, great about this project. One is we got so much usage in the first week that that map was up. We were amazed. It was over 20,000 hits. Wow. Right now, it's we're week three, I believe, and we're at 35,000 hits. So we know a lot of people from around the state are going to that map to try and find a place where they can use Wi-Fi. The other, the other side benefit is that a lot of people are writing the Office of Broadband and saying, hey, this parking lot, and they're going to the libraries. This parking lot is closed. It's 10 o'clock at night and there's a fence or this one doesn't work very well. So I'm getting a lot of great feedback and I'm contacting library directors every day, it seems and saying, did you know there's a fence? Oh yeah, we thought that was removed. Well, would you please <laughs> remove it? <laughs> or give us a sign, tell us what to do. So it's been a great feedback loop too. And again, what I love about it, of course, I'm the state librarian. What's not to love about having people talk about libraries every single day? And, and a new service and, and especially now, you know, feeling that libraries are are uh, active in response to the needs, uh, the urgent needs, the urgent connectivity needs of the, of the public. It's, it's great. So uh, what, uh, what comes next? What do you do? What do you, how do you build on this? Well, of course, what's great about establishing these partnerships is I think it's very clear that as we move forward with a bigger strategy and a bigger plan, and we are starting to talk about that, Libraries get to be at the table um, as one of the real key stakeholders in what works in their communities. I think I mentioned last time that one of the things that we do in this state, and this again is thanks to the office, the uh, extension office, is this practice of creating broadband action teams. And it's a pretty great way of bringing all the stakeholders together in a smaller community and libraries get to be part of those conversations. And it, there are all kinds of Department of Commerce um, grants available right now. We know that there's no more money coming to all of the states around broadband uh, infrastructure funding. And so it's great to know that we've got this network that we're building across the state where every community can raise their hand together and talk about what is really needed and and where the real holes are. The speed test that the Office of Broadband is hosting on its website, that's a really helpful device right now. You know, if there's one thing I have learned in the last couple of weeks, and I think, Don, you've probably talked about this before, but the key aha moment I had was looking at the broadband map that shows where this first round of um, I think it's Ardiff money, the, the rural opportunity uh, money is going and recognizing that our broadband mapping strategy, which has been widely acknowledged as being flawed, isn't going to be good enough, fast enough for some of this federal money. And so I think it's going to take a lot of local initiative to really point out where the shortcomings are and where the needs still are. And things like speed tests that demonstrate actual service levels, I think will be helpful. But it's something, again, if there's one thing that I think librarians, and I know I've got librarians on this call, if it's one thing I think we have learned from this um, experience, it's that we actually need to be pretty engaged in broadband. We need to educate ourselves. We need to talk to our other local partners, potential partners and stakeholders. And we need to actually prepare ourselves to be much better advocates and much better informed. And I'm speaking, I'm speaking to my, you know, this is my conversation I have with myself, that it really is important that we understand this world better and start to play in it. 
um, as strong advocates because we know a lot about what isn't working in our communities. Well, you would indeed, and uh, you make you know several great points. Uh, the one that strikes me relates to uh, the well, the library's role in providing information. So, what does that mean today? It's you know invariably it's a digital uh, environment, and you know having information is pointless unless you can access the information. And access today means some kind of connection. Connectivity is essential. And the, the role of the library to convene this conversation, to initiate this conversation at the community level, you know, what, what is the future, what is the present of our, of our uh, communications infrastructure here in our community, and what does it need to be, and how are we gonna, how, what's our plan to, you know, make it, make it stronger and better? Without regard to business model or technology, it's just, uh, we've seen this, uh, uh, before in a number of places, libraries have physically been the convener of that conversation. Not necessarily the subject expert, right? But just good at, at uh, a trusted entity, uh, which is really important in this stuff. And then also uh, a natural facilitator of those conversations because libraries, you know, as a generalist uh, can, you know, uh, make conversations uh, flow and, and bring in and identify stakeholders and the rest of it. So. That's that's great, uh, Don. There's there's a couple of very quick questions. Yeah, that sure. And needs to leave. What? So, um, <laughs> the two questions we've had are firstly, have you encountered issues with libraries and schools being uneasy about people loitering in parking lots in order to use the Wi-Fi? And the second question that came in was, was there any particular technology that worked better or was more affordable? Great question. Thank you for those questions. I was I meant to com, uh, comment on the first because of course it could cause some concern about a suddenly opening up a parking lot and what we did with this project is we said that in order to um, participate in putting this broader the stronger router outside you had to pledge to keep your parking lot open during working hours you know we I think we said eight to eight here in the Northwest doesn't get dark till almost 10 o'clock at night right now so and it starts to get light at five so we said please be open so that people can use it but if it's not safe or if your community doesn't like the idea of a 24 7 hot spot you don't have to keep it open the whole time but we urged people to work with their local communities and um, you know police departments just let people know that those pot hot spots were open so that there could be a drive by on the part of a patrol car so there could be some awareness that there might need to be a little oversight and in our smaller communities that seems to have worked quite well i mentioned that one of my parking lots was chained that was a result of an earlier problem with people loitering in the parking lot the signal is still strong people can sit park on the street but the parking lot is closed after I think 5 p.m. Yeah. And that's why. So yes, that is something you have to think about. We have signage that encourages people to stay in their cars, but you know, it, it, probably smaller communities, it's easier to manage that. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm sure that's true. And, and uh, signal is a great segue uh, there, Cindy. This is a great story. I'm, I'm sure we're going to want to hear the next chapter uh, uh, in the development of this in a, in a month or so and, and hope to have you back to keep, keep us up Thank you. on this running story. Thank you. Let me just say one thing quickly about the second question regarding technology. Just be sure you can filter if the library needs to be able to filter the signal. That was the one thing we had to think about. Ah, and yes. The last thing I will say to you is, be, as a result of this project, I believe it is because of this project and how much people are talking about libraries right now that I have been asked to speak to the governor's office at nine this morning and talk about curbside service. I don't think the full understanding of what libraries can offer was in the spectrum that they can offer. They don't have to be physically open to offer services. Not sure that was fully understood, when all the opening phases were outlined. And now as a result of this understanding, we get to talk about an interim service level of curbside. So 
Thank you very much. Well, okay, Cindy, great. Well, uh, give our regards to Governor Inslee in a little over half an hour and uh, tell him that you were hit on our, on our Zoom call today and <laughs> we appreciate it so much. Oh, thank uh, you. I'm, I'm an alert. I want to hear the other speakers, oh, please, but I'll, please do. I'll mute off. All right. So uh, uh, next up, we have Mark Colwell. Mark, uh, uh, Cindy was talking about signals, and, uh, and of course, that's the area of spectrum and the domain uh, uh, that uh, Vocal is working in. So tell us a little bit about what, what is educational broadcast services spectrum uh, and, and how it's relevant to this conversation, and what do you think we need to do? Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Don, for the uh, invitation. I'm really honored to be presenting alongside Don, um, uh, Cindy and John, who are such distinguished folks in the digital inclusion space. Uh, just quickly about Vocal and who we are. Uh, Vocal is a collaboration of five nonprofits who hold educational broadband service licenses. So for the, for the domestic folks, that's the 2.5 gigahertz band uh, in the U.S., um, and I'm gonna talk about that during my presentation. Uh, our mission is about advancing equity by building an educated, empowered, and engaged public. And we do a variety of programs to achieve that goal. We have a grant program, we make educational impact investments, we have fellowships. I work on the policy space, particularly around spectrum issues. But the one area I wanna put a plug in for today is um, our mobile hotspot program. Um, it's called Mobile Citizen. And it's a $10 a month service uh, over a uh, mobile uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, which I'm sure many are familiar with. So I had to get a plug in for them. If you want to learn more, please visit mobilecitizen.org. Um, and my topic today is about utilizing unused spectrum resources. So throughout Mark, the- do you want to do you want to hit ahead. your put your uh, slides in play? We're seeing your whole your whole format there. Ah, can you see it? All right. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Okay. So throughout the COVID pandemic, uh, FCC has been granting what are known as special temporary authorities uh, to deploy unused spectrum. So this spectrum is either it's been sold at an auction, someone has the license, but they've not yet deployed it because their, their timeline hasn't been met yet, or it's never been licensed to begin with. So some examples are very early in the, in the pandemic, did and other entities who had bought licenses in the broadcast incentive auction a few years back, they lent it to T-Mobile. And T-Mobile, using a software update, could expand the bandwidth on their mobile network immediately. Um, they also dish lent its AWS3 and other spectrum resources to AT&T. Um, so those are examples where someone already had the license and they just lent it for a period of time. In, in the case of the 2.5 EBS band and the 5.9 gigahertz band, uh, both of those are areas that in, in many places have never been licensed. And so I'm gonna talk to you about, about those two today because those could be particularly valuable in rural areas, but in the case of the 5.9 in, in, in urban areas as well. So EBS, let's start with the 2.5 band. Back in the 1960s in the Kennedy administration, the FCC set aside some spectrum uh, for educational television use, and that's the EBS band. Um, but in 1995, the FCC stopped issuing licenses in this band, and they haven't issued any licenses since, except for a handful of waivers. So today, EBS, there's about 1,300 licensees, like the vocal nonprofits, and they hold 2,190 licenses. And today's licenses cover about half of the geography of the U.S. and 85% of the population. So in many rural areas, about 50% of the U.S. geography has some access to EBS, and that covers about 15% of the population. And today, most EBS licensees uh, have a lease agreement uh, with a commercial provider, whether it's a WISP or in a lot of cases, it's Sprint and, and now T-Mobile uh, after the merger. Here's a general map of what EBS might look like in the US. There's five different channel groups, so it's a little bit tricky. Every map's a little different, but in general, this is the G channel group. This is what it would look like uh, in most places. So you can see in the West, um, a lot of counties have EBS available. I looked it up, we have a data set, and 
about 1166 counties have at least enough spectrum, 17 and a half megahertz, to do some sort of a broadband service. Uh, there are 422 counties that have all of the channels available, which means they can do some really robust service. The other potential opportunity for folks is there are, I said 90% have lease agreements. Well, there are a collection of, of folks who have licenses, but do not have a lease agreement. And based on new FCC rules that went into place last month, if they don't offer service by mid-October, they're at risk of losing their license. So that, there could be some good partnership opportunities where someone's got a license, they don't want to lose it, and they could maybe let you use the license to build out service to the community, but then they could serve their school, let's say if it's a school that holds the license. So this is a little bit geeky, but just the main point of this slide is there's a lot of spectrum in the EBS band. Uh, there's 117.5 megahertz, so all the red chunks are uh, EBS, and, um, and so in some areas, maybe the A and the C would be licensed, but the B, D, and G would be available. And you really only need kind of the, like I said, 17, 16 and a half megahertz is enough to set up a service. Um, and, and I said 422 counties, all of those channels are available. So there might be some, some places out there, folks on the call who um, have a lot of it available, which means you can offer you know, greater bandwidth uh, if you were to build a network. What can you actually do with EBS? Well, EBS is really a very special spectrum band. It offers great coverage and great capacity. So with the low band spectrum, it travels really far, but the bandwidth is, is limited. You can't get very many users on it. And with the millimeter wave, the high band spectrum, great capacity, but it only travels maybe a thousand feet. So you gotta put a lot of infrastructure in place. Not really ideal for kind of a suburban or a rural setting. EBS is a great mix of the both. Um, I've talked to a lot of providers that are getting, you know, four to eight miles of coverage. Uh, the, the power level is greater than other bands like CBRS, so it can travel through trees, it can travel through walls, so that's really good news. Other countries use EBS, uh, China, Japan, Canada, Mexico, all are users of the 2.5 band, so there's a robust equipment ecosystem that offers very affordable options in terms of radio tower infrastructure, as well as CPEs for end users. And there's even open source cores available. So those are the kind of components you need for a network and they're all relatively affordable in this band. Um, so if you, were to able, if you were able to get one channel group, let's say A123, um, you can serve about 15 to 25 households. Um, the total bandwidth on, on a tower, if you were to put the piece of that gear on a tower would be about 40 to 50 megabits per second. Now, if you could expand and maybe get two or three channel groups, you can see that the bandwidth would go up pretty dramatically. You could also deploy additional towers, or if you had two pieces, two radio uh, pieces of radio, you could point them in different directions and get additional bandwidth. Um, I've talked to some folks and a system, you know, that would use one channel group with one radio and, and putting it on maybe on top of a school or on top of a library might run anywhere from $25,000 to $35,000 all in. Um, that's for some pretty basic service. You could, of course, buy more advanced equipment. Um, just quickly, a couple of examples. You know, Northern Michigan is probably the best EBS example. They serve not only their campus of about, they have about 10,000 students now. They also serve 15,000 households in the Upper Peninsula of uh, Michigan. Uh, they've done a really good job of building out a network. They offer affordable service. This is a real key. Um, oftentimes broadband is not affordable. They offer it for $20 for students, $25 for veterans, and $35 for the community. And they also offer the community free classes through the university if you're a subscriber of their broadband service. Uh, Mural Net's another great story. They were able to deploy in the base of the Grand Canyon for the Havasupai tribe. Uh, they're located nine miles from any road. So we're talking, you gotta take a mule or a helicopter, you got to hike down to get to this tribe, but MuralNet was able to build a network there for just $10,000 uh, using an open source core. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on the last one, the Red Cliff Project, where the local school had a license and they partnered with a WISP to deploy service in a little town uh, about 15 miles from Vail, where the satellite service um, didn't work very well because uh, it doesn't work in the snow and they were getting about 318 inches of snow per year. 
Um, so the partnership model is really one that I wanted to highlight because Don's done a great job putting together a grant application that includes a project in Pottsboro, Texas. Um, Pottsboro identified about 300 students and teachers without home connectivity. Uh, the area library already supports teachers through a hotspot program they've got, and they reached out to a provider to see if they might be willing to serve. The provider already has lease agreements with the community college and the independent school district. So they've got two channel groups of EBS, and um, they put together a proposal. Uh, if they could get $35,000, Techway would throw in uh, to buy the rest of the equipment. And uh, then the library would get other grant money to do in you know, the devices that go in folks' homes. So an all-in cost of about $90,000 um, to get you know, service to about 40 homes. And of course, if you can check out these devices, you could you know, mix and match homes if, if it's a school kid during the school year or a low-income family some other time of the year. So that's, that's a really cool project that Don's been a part of that I helped talk with through with the TechWave folks. Um, very quickly, um, there's other spectrum opportunities. In, during the pandemic, uh, WISPA uh, is a group that filed for an STA for spectrum. It was originally dedicated for car safety, but the FCC has an open rulemaking that would make 45 megahertz of this band available for broadband. And 100 companies in 30 different states applied for and got an STA to deploy this service. I have the link here, but they may even be offering service in your county. It may be worth looking and reaching out to see if there could be a partnership there. Uh, but there's another example of Spectrum. It, it's, it was not used for this purpose, and now it can be used, at least in the STA context. It may be an option for a library to build something beyond their walls. Um, how do you actually apply? First, you've got to figure out if it's available in your county. I can certainly help you do that. The ne next thing you do is you write a one to two page uh, explanation of your project and email the FCC. And I can give you instructions on how to do that. And we've been told that they're writing back within you know, 72 hours to either ask more questions or to approve your application. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Now, of course, the STA is only a temporary authorization and there's a chance you could you know, lose the license at the end of that. Um, so partnering with someone who's already got a license might be a better option for a long-term plan, but there will be, um, there is an uh, EBS auction coming up. So maybe an opportunity to get a license in, in your area. Mark, so I think, can you uh, wrap for us? Yep. Um, uh, I had a little call to action. Um, I can answer some questions, but um, I'll go ahead and wrap up now. If you've got any questions for me, happy to answer them in the, uh, in the Q and A, but thanks Don for the opportunity. Thank you, Mark. Roll back that last slide uh, that you had. Ah, so. Yeah, That's sure. A good one. Uh, sure. Uh, there's, Let me see I don't know whether there's uh, an apology necessary here to assault people with the alphabet soup of uh, <laughs> wireless technology and that, that graph that Mark showed earlier with uh, the various channels that were open and the ones that are closed. <laughs> that is a simplest version of the whole thing, which is just a monstrously complex <laughs> set of available frequencies and uh, frequencies and licenses. The point is though that this is super valuable stuff. This is, this is lightweight infrastructure where the knowledge about it is equivalent to very hard costs of deploying uh, you know, wireline. I'm not saying that wireless is the same thing as fiber. We all want fiber to the home, but wireless is something that can be done quickly and one or two orders of magnitude uh, or more uh, less expensive than fiber. And right now it's, it's a priority to look at using different kind of wireless strategies in response. Uh, uh, you know, it's an urgent situation. So this is also uh, knowledge that'll have long-term value that, you know, that, that every location is a different mix of, of what kind of spectrum resources are available right where you are. Uh, you know, whether it's in this uh, EBS or CB, I'm not going to go through the, the list of things, but to know what you have is a starting point to figure out what kinds of things you can do. And we just urge every community to assess its local spectrum environment, look for licenses and check for, you know, uh, interference and so forth as a baseline for creating a plan that builds on what's already happening with these uh, hotspots, you know, uh, being poked out the window. 
There was a question about uh, megahertz and gigahertz. Uh, it's just like bits, you know, uh, there are more if they're uh, a giga than there are if they're a mega, a thousand times more. And it's the same thing with hertz. So uh, uh, there's a rough correlation between hertz and bits. More hertz, as Mark was saying, uh, can carry more bits. This millimeter wave is, a, is like 60 or so gigahertz uh, level. Uh, carries a lot of data, but not very far. The lower frequencies carry it farther, but not as much of it. So finding a balance uh, between those is, is kind of what it is. Uh, I, I, there are more questions I know people have, but we're gonna move to John uh, and the idea of uh, you know, response and, and working to answer the needs that people have today is, is uh, urgent and important. Uh, but as we do that, it has long-term uh, implications for, uh, you know, what comes next. So uh, we're, it's great to have a thinker like John uh, Saladon to help us create that context for uh, long-term. So we're acting both immediate and urgent, and we're trying to think what the implications are for uh, setting the stage for long-term investment. The budget crunch is definitely coming. It's arrived already. So everything you do today is really important for the long-term. And so John, we're just happy to have you. Uh, John wrote uh, a, a, break, a groundbreaking uh, paper a few months ago before this all hit. And so he's gonna kind of tell us what's changed in his view since then and what he thinks uh, uh, we should all do today. So John, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Don. I hope everybody can hear me and that the camera is working. I appreciate the chance to talk for a few minutes. And at a, I will admit, broader, perhaps more abstract level, but I think an important one, because we all know the world has changed. Indeed, I don't think I'm gonna say anything that everybody doesn't already know, but I'm hoping that by putting it together, we can begin a conversation about what we need to communicate. The people on this call are people who every day bring broadband, bring library services to people. The world has changed in a way that makes this knowledge more valuable, but it's got to get out. So here's my thesis in a few points. And then as time permits, I'll drill down a little bit. First, we don't need to talk anymore about the future of broadband. We are now living the future of broadband. We have fast forwarded to the broadband age. We've been talking for 25 years about what was the broadband world gonna look like. It looks like today in some fundamental ways, how we learn, how we work, how we consult, consult healthcare, how we visit family and friends. Secondly, this dramatic change in usage has demonstrated, I think beyond any debate, that broadband is the essential pathway to participation in society today. Again, people have said this for a long time. People, leaders who are on this call have talked about the importance of broadband. But I think it's now undeniable to a broader audience that one cannot fully participate in American society without broadband and good broadband. In the report that Don referenced, the Benton Institute report that we put out last October, we said that the goal for 2030 should be that everyone in America could use high performance broadband. But that's happening today. Think about upstream speeds. Just think about upstream speeds. The broadband, I'm sorry, the definition of broadband currently used by the Federal Communications Commission is three megs upstream. You put several people on the kind of symmetrical video applications we're using simultaneously on a single broadband connection, and it's easy to get beyond three meg. There are some video applications that send bits at a higher than three megs just with a single user. So it's a clear demonstration that the way we've seen broadband in the past doesn't meet the usage uh, profiles of today. Next point. We don't know for sure, right? But it's very likely that the changes we have seen in this crisis 
will continue to obtain in some manner in the future. Okay, just think about work. Clearly, we don't anticipate a circumstance where everybody is working from home the way they have for the last month. And I, that's an overstatement. There's so many frontline workers who are going into dangerous situations um, to serve society, healthcare workers, first responders. So let me say it a different way. Lots of people who've been working from home in the last two months are not going to be working from home forever. But there's a high likelihood of change, right? Just think about Twitter and Facebook's announcements in the last couple of weeks. Facebook, I think yesterday, some people who worked in offices will not be expected to work in offices the same. You've seen the same kind of shift in healthcare, in education, 55 million students affected by school closures. So we can assume, I believe, that there's gonna be greater reliance on home broadband in the future than there's been in the past. That's not a big assumption. But of course, home broadband is not built to be an enterprise system. And it's why quality matters. And by quality, I mean the speed at which we send information, the speed at which we receive information, the lag in the speed, the latency, and the amount of data where able to use on a month. Okay, so these points add up to the notion that broadband is important, more important than it might have been in December 2019, more important than many people understood it to be. But we're still talking about broadband. So my next points are, I think we need to understand that we're in an economic circumstance where broadband is an essential part of long-term economic recovery. And Don said it right a minute ago. He said the difference between short-term and long-term. We've had stimulus legislation, very important stimulus legislation, to give people assistance immediately. That's right, and it's necessary. But there comes a time when we think about recessions of the kind of scope and severity of this one, where we consider not just the immediate, but what can we do over years? Look, I'm not an economist, I'm not making a prediction, but in the last recession, 2008, it was seven years before we returned to full employment. In other words, seven years before the employment rate post-recession returned to what it had been before the recession. And that's not a big surprise, economies return to positive growth before they return to full employment. That's almost by definition. Now, there's a lot of conjecture about this recession. Some people say recovery will come fast because it's the exogenous the fact that when it goes away, if we solve the healthcare crisis, things bounce back. On the other hand, it looks like the unemployment rate is going to be the highest since the Great Depression. And there's a significant loss of businesses that may not immediately come back into effect. So there's the prospect of significant unemployment for some period of time, say five years. We hope that that's not true. A long-term emphasis on broadband says to us, we may not be able to deploy a new broadband system in a week or a month or the speed of the stimulus bills, but it's worth doing over a three to five year period, two to three, two to four, whatever it takes, because it's going to help in two different ways. And this is, I think, important. Broadband deployment, and not just deployment, broadband efforts will create economic activity in the short term. That's what infrastructure projects do. They employ people. But secondly, as the world changes, this, the effects of broadband will be to empower people, empower people to find employment. And this is important for another economic reason. We have a very severe cyclical downturn built on a 40 year increase in income inequality. Okay? So we already had a huge problem with income inequality. This recession is making it worse. 
something like the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell of the Fed made a point in the speech last week that something like 40% of American families who were in February earning less than $40,000 a year lost a job in March, right? 40% of households making less than $40,000 a year lost a job in March. That's exacerbating income inequality. So we need broadband not only for the direct economic effects of deployment, we need it as well to help battle against income inequality, which has steadily gotten worse. And we do that by empowering people's economic opportunity. Last point. I've been talking about broadband. It's easy in these circumstances to talk about broadband in terms of laying fiber. It's traditional infrastructure. That would be a mistake because our goal is not the deployment of networks. It's that people be empowered to use networks that reach them. That means critical to a broadband plan are, is deployment, competition, because competition is what makes broadband more affordable and makes the quality higher, dealing with issues of affordability and access, and the Benton Institute has recently made a proposal for the creation of a new broadband credit to ensure that people can get fixed broadband, families that are eligible, like the, what, more than now, 38 million families that file for unemployment or people who file for unemployment compensation in the last two plus months. And of course, community institutions. All four of those pieces need to be in a big broadband package. We need to hire people, not just to build networks, we need to give support to libraries and schools to have the people who are able to train, able to help bring other people online. We need to expand the reach of usage by expanding the resources available to Americans. And that is necessary to get the job done. So one last word on, on this. Don asked us to talk about a call to action. You guys are acting. You're in the business of acting. So you don't need much from me to tell you what to do, but let me just talk about this. I've talked a minute about the report we put out in October. We're going to put out, we've always planned, to have another report this October to revise and rethink our recommendations. Now the world has changed. We would love to hear from people, and we think it's important that your voices be heard in the communities. How? You talk to users. How do they think the world will be different for broadband? Because that's a critical input to public policy. You talk to people who represent communities, seniors aging in place, K through 12 students seeking access to materials, employers, people working, trying to figure out how they can work in this new environment. It's important for policymakers, for everybody to hear what you think usage patterns are going to be in the future. One of the things we heard when we put our report together last year was from libraries who said, look, people come to us to talk to us about the problems they have getting online because they want to go to a place that's trusted and libraries are tr trusted, okay? So you will know, you'll have an insight into how users, usage is changing. And then thirdly, your views on how to make broadband strategy future-proof. We'll never predict the future, but we can anticipate trends to be able to put in place what's necessary. And understanding the likely trajectory of society and how it infects libraries and, and people generally will be important. So I think to the extent that those views are heard, they will be valuable. To the extent that you communicate them to us, we will find them invaluable. And so at the beginning of the session, I put in a chat, the email uh, that we are using to gather information and comments from people, it's broadband, at benton.org. We appreciate the chance to be here today. We'd love to hear from people going forward.
Thank you, Don. Wow, thank you, John. That's that's terrific. Uh, you know, it's expansive, and that's the dance. You know, back and forth between what we're having must do today, and and not losing sight of uh, the greater vision. So, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you set thank up. You. you made you made a great point about you know access is critical, but insufficient. Right, you have to have it, but it's not enough. You yes. have to be enabled. Uh, would be another way to say it. Right. It's a big challenge for uh, libraries. Let me stop right there because we're we're coming close to our time. But I wanted to uh, put a general question. And while I'm doing that, John, please repost that that email address you just mentioned in the in the chat for so people okay. can find it easily. <clears throat> but I'd like to ask people just an open question. Uh, you know, what topics would you like, would you like to hear about? Would, you know, who would you like to, who else would you like to hear from? This would be an opportunity to kind of weigh in in the chat. We'll sort through these as we're laying out the agenda for the, for the weeks ahead. Um, but this point about uh, support, it, you know, traditionally people knew you was going to the library and the library helps them set up a, you know, a web mail or something, some kind of a different account. And they can train them, give them classes, or sit next to them uh, to help them kind of navigate specific websites. Well, not today. So how how can libraries do support for new users without being with those new users? That's to me that's a big challenge. I mean, getting them set up originally and then doing some sort of a a, a screen share or remote control seems like a way to do it. One library, uh, they're holding parking lot classes. So this, the shared screen is up on the, up on the side of a big uh, a panel truck and they're, you know, doing a lesson there. And I guess they have a loudspeaker or something in the, uh, in, the uh, uh, in the parking lot. But that's a big issue uh, because new users are so susceptible and, you know, just let giving people access if they don't know what to do with it, it's almost like leading lambs to slaughter. The, the internet is not a totally safe environment. And so supporting people is, is what they do. The other, the other thing that seems important for libraries to do in this regard is help uh, government agencies, public agencies at all level of government in the design of their applications, which need feedback from ordinary people who librarians interact with every day. And this is, a, this is a plug for libraries to be called upon to be part of any kind of design and development of, of public, uh, public services, uh, you know, e-government in, in a word. So uh, uh, were there, did you, Stephen, did you see any more questions for John? Number of open source. Broadband, thanks. Oh, uh, Cindy, thank you for plugging uh, Shelby, the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition. Uh, in terms of policy, like spectrum policy and E-rate policy, Bob Bocher's on. He's an active member and a, and a, a tech leader for ALA and, and uh, central to Shelby's policy development on a number of these issues. I urge everybody to check out shlb.org. Uh, consider joining. It's it's next to nothing. And yet you get uh, very fresh information from Washington and you get your voice uh, a place to be heard uh, as well. Uh, so we're on the hour. Uh, if there's anything pressing, uh, otherwise, I think we will close the recorded session now.